James Day, public television pioneer and chairman of the CUNY TV Advisory Board, passed away in April 2008. His legacy includes the series Day at Night, which aired for 130 episodes beginning in 1973. The program features interviews with many of the great thinkers and achievers of the 20th century. These 30-year-old programs have been restored. The interviews remain fresh and relevant today, exploring issues that are still important to society. Showing them again is CUNY TV's tribute to Jim and his contributions to public television. Ann Baxter knew she wanted to be an actress before she could spell the word. And it didn't take her long to realize that ambition. She made her Broadway debut at the age of 13. Three years later, she played in the first of a long string of motion pictures that were to bring her an Academy Award for her supporting role in The Razor's Edge and an Oscar nomination for her starring role in All About Eve. 20 years after starring in All About Eve, she returned to Broadway, singing and dancing in the musical version of that story, Applause. The critics loved it. She's currently being seen on Broadway in the musical Noel Coward in Two Keys. Miss Baxter, 30 years ago, you told a reporter that you'd rather be thought of as beautiful than intelligent. Would you say the same thing My today? dear man, I never in, the, in this world could say that. Where in the devil did you read that? I've forgotten the source now, but I dug God it up. God knows I have. Yes. Never in You'd this rather world. be thought of as both, I should imagine. No. I, no? I, I don't want to be thought of as either. You know, there's a, there's a thing in this country that drives me right up the wall. You know, uh, Americans label everything, you know? Mm -hmm. Something has to be uh, Either this an or award that. winner so yeah. many times, yeah. or it has to be uh, better than something else, or mm -hmm. a favorite something or other. What's your favorite this, your favorite that? Mm -hmm. Or which would you rather do, films or yeah. uh, um, the stage? I don't know. Really, there's no choice well, at all. Why? It's it? like a pinball machine. Yeah. Well, uh, I don't want to be known as either. Mm -hmm. I just like to be known as, as an actress. And, th and that came very early, I gather. Yes, I'm, I'm afraid it came around three years old. Really? How, how <laughs> well, there were private showings. Uh -huh. <laughs> My family tell a mar marvelous story. Were you story. acting at three, really? Oh, yes, and no doubt, yes. And I was an only child mm -hmm. and a very happy one and uh, very close to my parents because of the fact that I was an only child and they'd lost a child before me. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, music has always meant a great deal to me. Uh, it's my hobby in a funny way. Mm -hmm. And uh, evidently they were playing bridge this evening. I was around six or seven. We were mm -hmm. in Rye. We'd moved from Michigan City, Indiana to Rye, New yeah. York. And there was some symphony music on the radio and I asked if I could dance for them. And could I use some of Mother's scarves? And she said, yes, dear, as long as you put them back. Mm -hmm. So I came down and evidently did the dance of the Seven Veils, <laughs> which I had never read about, and ended up stark naked mm -hmm. and slowly walked up the stairs, and they very politely applauded. They were in stitches, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I went to bed. So that was a performance of a kind. Yes. But when, <laughs> when did you decide that uh, you were going to pursue this? Because what I've read, it, that also came fairly early. Yes. Well, I don't think there was anything else I ever wanted to do, Jim. I had... Um, the first part I played was in transition. There was a grade here mm -hmm. in Mamaroneck Avenue School in White Plains between kindergarten and first mm -hmm. grade. And I played Mrs. Santa Claus, and I played in all the school plays all the way. So when I was 11, mother and dad said, uh, we'd like to plan your education then, you know, boarding mm -hmm. school if necessary, or, or uh, there are endless numbers and, uh, and kinds of universities and in Europe and in here, you know, where, what do you want to do? We'd like to, you to do one thing and, and do it well. Mm -hmm and not be a jack of all trades. So I said, But I, the important thing was to do it well, whatever you chose. Do one thing, do it well. They didn't want me to disperse yeah. any given talent. So I said, I would like to try to be an actress. No resistance from them? Then. No, not at all. As a matter of fact, if I'd said a plumber, they would have said fine. Mm. Uh, as long as it was something I really cared about and was yeah. going to work at. So I went into New York, took 
drama lessons at Third Theodora Irvine School of the Theatre. Came out with my father on the 517. Mm -hmm. You know, we commuted from Bronxville. And um, then through a fluke, I through something such as I saw this afternoon at the Neighborhood Playhouse, mm -hmm. you know, where they have young actors in, in short plays, I got a job. At which, what age? That, at 13. And I think they were a little taken aback, uh -huh. but uh, uh, they took it in stride, mm -hmm. so did I. I don't think they quite took my acting career as seriously as I did, because I had no sense of humor at all at this you didn't? point. Oh, Gad. I used to Took go buy Maybelline blue eyeshadow and put it under my <laughs> eyes and over my eyes, <laughs> practice crying, <laughs> lock myself in my room, fall on the piano with a crash, all while they were away, uh, you know. Yeah. I'm almost hesitant to bring up any more quotations, but I did see one that you have said of yourself at the age of 12 that you were fat and pudgy. That I, oh, I was. You were? I was square. Not at that age, later mm. on. Oh. In adolescence. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was in the usual adolescent emotional morass, mm. and uh, was acting any a, a way out of that in any sense? No, it no. made it almost more difficult because oh. there was a lot of pressure. When I yeah. came out, for instance, um, to make the tests for Rebecca, I was 15, mm. and I was playing a svelte young woman, uh, quite a few years older than myself, and I, they put me in wax baths at Elizabeth Arden, and I. I got rug burned from doing exercises <laughs> on the carpet in the Chateau Elysee Hotel, <laughs> and I had, in one of the one of the tests with Mr. Olivier, I had a rubber girdle on. It was absolutely immobile from here <laughs> to here. At the age of fifteen, I was fifteen, and I I was just square, hmm. and and I was kind of storing nuts for the winter, you know. <laughs> I had a round face with a couple of you didn't raisins get that in it. role either, did you? No, I yeah. was too young. I had a moon you were face. to play Laurence Olivier's wife at the age of 15? Well, I say, it was kind of crazy, wasn't yes. it? Mm. After so. your Broadway debut at the age of 13, you went to, you studied with Maria Uspenskaya. With Uspenskaya. She came uh, backstage and mm -hmm. asked me if I would like to join the group. So you were invited to work with yes, her, even at an early age? Yes, which was Her youngest pupil, thrill. I imagine. I was the youngest pupil, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. And she taught me an enormous amount. But the biggest thing she ever taught me my problem was being tense, very mm. tense, very nervous. To the point where in the middle of scenes I'd be going up and down on my toes and not even know it, you know. Mm. Bundle of nerves. And when I left the school, I was originally very much afraid of Madame. All of us were. She, she didn't uh, dispel this illusion. She used it. <laughs> <laughs> and she was sitting in the corner of this old studio on 67th Street uh, in her big overstuffed chair, chain smoking, like a little mm. tartar. And I sat in the chair opposite her, and I was finished. I was no longer afraid of her, you see. Mm -hmm. And I was completely relaxed. And she looked at me, and she said, Anne. I said, yes, madame. She said, you see how you are now? I said, yes, madame. That's the way you should go into a scene. I said, like this? And she said, yes. Do you know it has taken me 37 <laughs> years to learn what the hell she meant? <laughs> and to do it. Yes. To do it. What did she mean? She mean total coolth, total relaxation, mm. total concentration, mm. but total relaxation. Mm -hmm. And I am doing it. I have learned to do it in the Noel Coward evening mm -hmm. with Hume Cronin and Jessica Tandy because they are so superb, so professional. We've all been through the nerves. We played it 10 weeks mm -hmm. in very important cities. We, we're like, I don't know. It's different every night and it's fresh mm -hmm. every night. We discover something every night and mm -hmm. the audiences are all, always different. It's incredible mm -hmm. how different they it are. It makes a difference playing with certain kinds of people then on the oh, stage. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, and yes. And you always learn. Sometimes it's like mm -hmm. wet cement, you know. Yeah. Oh, 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 dreadful. And sometimes they're just so with you, and you just ride on them, like, like body surfing. It's like yeah. body surfing. And you know? reach beyond yourself then. Yes, it all becomes terribly real and terribly mm. fresh. Why is Noel Coward such fun? Quality. Real quality. Mm -hmm. And his wicked sense of humor. And his, his, his real poignard stuck in, in the real human foible. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are some lines in that first area. 
that are very pointed at Americans. They're not just funny. <laughs> <laughs> there we are suddenly, we were naked. <laughs> yes. And it gives and the performer you know, a real sense. Sometimes sensing. on the, on the matinee, there is a pregnant silence. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy, it's that marvelous gives, fun. Gives real satisfaction to the performer uh, then. Yeah. Mm. And this, he, he manages with this so-called light, wicked touch. He digs very deep. Mm. And I have found many people, not only friends of mine, who have come back two and three times because they miss, you know, a lot because they're laughing, you know, and they miss, mm. uh, they, they know they've missed a line and, and, and they, it's too late to go back. And so they come back and sit and see it again. You never had so much fun playing in all the no. years you've played. No, this is a very special experience. It may never happen again. Mm -hmm. I know too much about this damn quicksand business yeah. I'm in. Uh -huh. You know, and when you have a good experience, savor it. And this is true of life. Mm -hmm. Always try to really know how good something is when you're in the when middle of it. Not and later. No. And when you have a nice lunch with a friend, you know, mm. uh, or you have a, a lovely letter from someone, mm. or enjoy it, know it at the time. Mm. I'm always saying, oh, isn't this fun? Well, this is fun. Being alive. Yes, mm. quite right. Mm. I want to take you back. We were talking earlier about performing with different kinds of people. Your first movie was with John Barrymore, wasn't it? No. Wasn't? No, it wasn't. Wallace Beery. My Wallace Beery. Yes, of course. I played a prairie flower in a thing called 20 Mule Team. Yes. <laughs> and that was, what, 14, 15 years old? Uh, 15, no, I, I was 16. 16. I was mm -hmm. 16. And uh, then I did The Great Profile. That was with John that Barrymore, was the of course. Picture. Yeah. With Mr. Barrymore. He had a male nurse with him, you know. And you know, he did that picture to pay off his tailor. Is that right? Because he was broke. Mm. And uh, he loved beautiful clothes, and he had owed, I think, three or four thousand dollars to Mariani and Davis. Mm -hmm. And this was his, he had to go to work to pay it off, because mm. he didn't really want to work at all. And uh, you know what was interesting, Jim? Uh, he would be in, in a kind of nether world in between scenes and during rehearsals, and he had idiot cards, because as he said, these lines aren't worth learning, and I couldn't have agreed with him more. <laughs> but when the camera turned on, and it was rolling, there, it was as if you had plugged him in, like an electric current. And it, it, it's all it is is concentration, there's no question. But it's a great lesson in concentration yeah. to watch a man whose mind was even flaccid, you know? suddenly galvanized by the fact mm. that he was on stage. Sheer professionalism, then. That's correct. Mm. Over the years after that, you played in a good many movies, but played a great many movies, as a matter of fact. But at one point, you said that you were cast in library and rules. Oh, no. I did, now, this is a, a crack I did make. It's yeah. true. Mm. Um, to many people, and, and frankly to Mr. Zanuck. There were two general categories. I see, this is why I'm hypersensitive to categories. Two general categories of women. I mean, if you had brains, you had no sex. If you had sex, you had no brains. And you had it was brains. either broads or librarians, <laughs> and he had some crazy idea that I had brains, you see. <laughs> <laughs> so we'd, we'd be down at Palm Springs playing some ghastly game, and nobody could get it or whatever, and he'd point mm. his finger at me, and there I was on the, on the warm dime trying to, you know, fulfill this erroneous idea yeah. of his. But uh, it did make it difficult. I don't think they knew what to do with me, Jim, because I had I had won an Academy Award for a part that was uh, a woman who was 40 and uh, this was on ra dope. The and razor's drunk, edge. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I was 23. Mm. Now, what were they going to do? You know, I mean, mm. I was no threat to Betty Grable, <laughs> God knows. <laughs> so whenever there was a part that... Uh. Uh, either some director, like Joe Mankiewicz, wanted me for, or uh, somebody got sick, or, or, or they didn't know how to cast it, mm -hmm. then, or it had an accent, a foreign accent of some kind, they <laughs> called me, which delighted me, because mm -hmm. I like to do different kinds of things. That's the whole point. Were you freelancing at this point? You did break away from the studio no, at one point. No, I was there 14 in, years. Oh, 14 years. That's a long time. You grew up in the studio. Went to school there, as a yes, matter of fact, Yes, I went to school you? in the school mm -hmm. of Roddy McDowell and his sister Virginia and myself. Stanley Clements and Linda Darnell. Mm. 
And then whoever else was there. I, we, they had an arrangement, you know. Miss Clamp is a superb woman. Mm. And is still there. They had an arrangement with University High School so that we get our diploma, because the studio was hardly going to give a diploma <laughs> from 20th Century Fox. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we went to University High School, and um, uh, Freddie Bartholomew and I, he graduated from the Metro on the lot school, and I graduated from Fox in the That's same it. graduating class. At University High School. At right? University High School in uh, West Los Angeles. Yes. <laughs> One of your big breaks, I suppose, was All About Eve, oh, where you played so. that. That was another thing. great mm. experience, and we did savor that, too. Mm. It was bigger for Betty than for me, because Betty fell in love on top of doing Margot. Yeah. But uh, that was uh, the only experience I can liken to the present one at the Ethel Barrymore Theatre. Mm -hmm. That's the a only totally different kind of role. Why was it a similar experience? Just losing yourself and... Uh, because the part I had was excellent. Mm high quality, and required characterization, which yeah. I love. Yeah, I mean, it had, Sophie had real character. Yeah. I understood her. She was a real person, and he knew her. Mom knew her. He did. And the odd darn thing, Tim, is that the, the, the second part of the evening is about Somerset Mom. Oh. Isn't that mm. funny? Yes. It's a is strange it, equation. Is it true that the role uh, that you were playing was uh, derived from an understudy you had in your all about Eve, you mean? Yeah. It's written about you that oh, yes. your understudy, when, when you made your Broadway yes, debut at 13, that, that you she, did. She was 23. She was 23. I was 13. 13. And her name was Cora Smith. But she had she some, of these, some of these qualities. Oh, yes, she used to say, I'm going to feed you a poisoned oyster. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Mm. And those eyes, she had beautiful, yeah. big, ripe olive eyes. And I'd come to my mother and I'd say, Listen, Cor Cora said she's going to. Feed me a poison oyster. You think she means it? <laughs> <laughs> it just made me uneasy. I don't think yeah, I had oysters for I quite see. a few years. <laughs> <laughs> what was it like to come back to Broadway years later and play what is known as the Betty Davis role in the musical version of All About Eve? It was a fascinating experience. You said you were a non-dancer. It must have been a tactical Well, no, I, I love to dance, but I mean, after all, doing Ron Fields, very complicated, pat your head, you know, on your yeah. tummy routines or something else. And in order to train for this, I had to do four hours of ballet a day. Well, you do four hours of ballet for a start, and then rehearse, mm -hmm. and then sing. You know, mm -hmm. it, it's a new experience. I only, I've only had, I had about, oh, what, six months of ballet. That's all. Mm -hmm. When I was around 14. So I knew basically, I, I love the ballet. I'm a ballet man, you know, I love yeah. it. But uh, it was terribly hard for me and uh, very exhausting physically. Mm -hmm. And uh, I love doing it. But Why? Boy, you, well, because it's, it's a great part, for Pete's mm -hmm. sake. And uh, I liked singing. It was fun, and I liked the, the atmosphere backstage. Uh, I never knew what a gypsy was, for instance, until I did applause. And that's a whole world. The dancers from show to show mm -hmm. to show. And they're in Tell what a gypsy is? Yes. Who moves from show to show? Yes, they're, mm. they're the gypsies, they're the dancers, mm -hmm. boys and girls. Specialty dancers, all kinds mm. of dancers. They've had every lesson known to man. They got most of them do tap, modern jazz, ballet. A lot of them were going to start out and be Nureyev, yeah. you know, or, or Boronova, and then did this instead. Some of them can sing, some of them come from the ranks of gypsy into an enormous mm -hmm. career. Mm. But they're fascinating people and very sweet and loyal and wonderful. And they have their own restaurants and their own really? after theater. Joe Allen's. Uh -huh. Well, in, in applause, they did. They, they, they reproduced Joe Allen's. And the gypsies carry off Margot mm -hmm. to an after theater party at uh, Joe Allen's. Oh. And she has this wild dance with them. Mm. It was fun. But I really, I think the musical theater is, is a real bitch. It's terribly, terribly hard, especially on a woman. Mm -hmm. You don't do anything else. Nothing else at all. I had my children here in New York, they were in school here, two of my children, I had mm -hmm. three. And um, we were ships that passed in the afternoon, as I, oh. they came home, I went for a voice lesson, or this lesson, oh. or that lesson, 20 minutes of ballet before every performance. And on Sunday, I, I dragged myself out of bed at 10.30 in the morning, and we'd have a, I'd give the whole day to them, and by 8.30 at night, you know, 
I was the color of your shirt. <laughs> Do they show Which is any? Blue in case you don't <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Do they show any of the predilections of the young Ann Baxter to go on to the stage themselves? Well, uh, Katrina was interested in drama, but she mm. really wants to write music, and she's extremely talented. So I'm glad she's decided on that. Melissa worries me not a little. Mm. She has always wanted to be a nurse, a therapist, to work with crippled children. Mm. And now she thinks maybe she'd like to be an actress, so we don't know. Mm. Nobody who wants to be an actress says maybe they want to be an actress. They better want to do that more than they want to eat. You're going to take the same position it. your parents took with you then? I think if she's really serious, mm. uh, but you'll have to work. Are they as independent as you were at that age? I think so. I've tried to make them so. Mm -hmm. That's important. My youngest child was thinking of being an opera star. Mm. I love that. She picked a hard one, didn't she? <laughs> yes. And she's doing very well at ballet. She's mm. a fine young dancer. Mm. You may recall some years ago, you and I talked like this on one evening in San Francisco. I remember on it vividly. Television. Why do you recall it? Because I recall it because of the telephone call you got when the show was all over. It was a live show then. You put two and two together when you read that we were going to be married? Is that it? Hmm? Huh? Yes. Uh, yes, indeed. It. Well, um, you, why don't you set up well, the story, because it's an odd story. Yeah, because I wanted to ask you about your grandfather, and that was what we talked about that evening. Yes. Uh, and your grandfather... He had died about uh, yes. ten days before. And that, of course, is Frank Lloyd Wright. And he, it was, we talked about him and, and uh, your reminiscences. And after the show, you got a telephone call from a man you'd never met before. Well, he lied. He said he was our mutual friend, who had said to me in mm. Australia, he, our mutual friends mm. were Australian. Mm. And they said, oh, we've had this very nice man for you to meet. He's an American. He's down here and has interests in mm. Australia. And he never appeared. So he was afraid. He tracked me down at KQED, you yes. see. And he was afraid if he said Randolph Gold that I wouldn't come to the phone, which I probably wouldn't have. Yes. <laughs> so he said, it was Peter Bailey calling. Mm -hmm. And I picked up the phone and said, Pete, great, are you here? I, I, is, you know, is... And he said, well... <laughs> <laughs> This is Randolph Gold, and I said, oh, for heaven's sake. And he wanted to take me to dinner, and I said, well, what about, we'll just have a drink or something. Well, no, please, would I have dinner with him? And I thought, well, the Bailey's have been nice to me. And that turned out to be my husband and father of my two children. Yes. No, but and he had never seen me in a picture. Is that right? Never. <laughs> His idea of, of, of a movie is Gigi every <laughs> once in ten years, you know what I mean? <laughs> and he's happy to go and see yes. it again. <laughs> I want to ask you once again then about your grandfather and your remembrances of him. You knew him quite well. He encouraged you to be an actress, did he not? Well, encouraged me. Uh, it was a fact by the I time see. we picked up oh. our threads again. Mm -hmm. But do you know, Jim, that he designed a theater for me when I was three years old? No. I never knew it. I didn't know. He showed it to me himself when his big exhibit was going around the world that Oscar Stonerop designed mm -hmm. years ago. I was with him that night. And he said, did you ever see the little theater I designed for you, little granddaughter? And I said, my word, no. And it's like a fairy palace. Mm -hmm. It was pale green, and it had all kinds of spires and turrets and a long reflecting pool in, in the center and mm -hmm. flags, long mm -hmm. flags. It was. I'd give anything to have the rendering. I don't know what's happened to it. Mm. It was never built. It was in concrete block, the whole thing, mm. in pale green. Did he ever see any of your pictures? Oh, yes. He was very happy with my career. He mm. liked, he was, in, in fact, delighted. Mm. But he loves the theater. And he, he, he and I got along very well. You did? <laughs> I think one of the most fun Did you times, get some of your independence from him? Probably. It mm. certainly runs through our family. Does. My mother's a very independent lady. Mm. And, uh, You're about to say one time. I'm sorry I interrupted. Mm. No, uh, I, used to, I love to do mm. accents. It's just for fun. Mm. And I never saw him laugh harder when I, he had some fan letters from Wales, and I read the fan letters to him in a Welsh mm. lilt. And oh, he, he had a most marvelous laugh anyway, an explosive laugh. The only laugh more explosive than that is Jessica Tandy. When she mm. laughs, you know what it's like? It's like a bunch of sleigh, bo uh, sleigh bells falling downstairs. <laughs> it's just heaven. She has a couple of explosive times in the, in the coward play. Mm. That, that mm. I have a hard time not breaking up. Yeah, you know, nice. it's marvelous. I think so. Was Mr. Wright a man of humor? Are He's... you joking? He had the most wicked <laughs> sense of humor in the world. <laughs> he did. As wicked as Sano. Uh -huh. Oh, yes. Enjoyed a joke. Oh, and how? He had such an austere mean about him. Oh, no, he loved to laugh. Uh, Do you 
Did you ever hear what he said to Tallulah Bankhead? No. Oh, I'll never forget that day he came on the set. And uh, this was a picture called A Royal Scandal. And uh, uh, I said, Miss Bankhead, uh, my, my grandfather, Mr. Frank Lloyd Wright, is coming. Oh, I'd love to meet that sweet old man. Oh, I felt <laughs> like saying, look out, he's not a sweet old man. <laughs> But he came on the set in a gabardine outfit with a gabardine beret and, you know, looking divine. And uh, so I said to Lou, he's, he's here. And she came out ready to inundate him with her charm. And just as she's about to say something, he said, Hello, Miss Bankhead. Still at it? <laughs> and her jaw absolutely dropped. He went, no. <laughs> and then, then he sat outside while we were rehearsing. It was an unfortunate scene because she had to slap me in it. Mm. And uh, here was his voice uh, just outside the light saying, doesn't look so bad under the lights, does she? Oh, <laughs> well, I tell you, when, that, when he shot that scene, yeah. I mean, she really whacked me. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't blame her, mm -hmm. but I couldn't help it. <laughs> it wasn't my doing. What's brought you the greatest satisfaction in acting? Oh, that's a terribly hard question. Mm -hmm. You'll laugh at me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> laugh, I guess. There's a certain communication with an audience. It's like a communication be between people who are truly in love mm -hmm. or truly, truly great friends. There's something that happens between you and the audience. And you can touch them and communicate with them and truly entertain them and i don't know it's a, it's a it's a delicious scarlet thread mm -hmm. can you imagine but being... it's a form of love it is can you it's... imagine being without that audience then and that love oh basically? there are many forms of love mm -hmm. god knows a compassion a feeling with mm -hmm. compassion well that mm -hmm. means calm is together passion is you know so you feel mm -hmm. with them and they with you Mm. That's the Greek word, agape. I'm never sure how to pronounce that either. It drives mm. me nuts. Every dictionary is different. <laughs> <laughs> I see. But the fact that it's there is the important thing, That's however right. pronounced. That's right. Yes. That is correct. Thank you very much. You're welcome, mm. Jim. <laughs>